Next year, or I Fly My Rounds Tempestuous is a remarkable series of poems by Lorene Niedeker, never published in her lifetime. Lorene Niedeker was a relatively unknown poet living on Black Hawk Island near Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, who became affiliated with the objectivist poetry movement of the early 20th century after reading about it in Poetry Magazine. Deeply dedicated to place, not afraid to add surrealist touches in her work and employing a deep humility, Niedeker was denied the appropriate amount of awareness of her work during her lifetime. The subject of Niedeker's calendar poems from the 1930s is our focus today. These poems actually written in the space between dates on her personal calendar are epigrammatic, often difficult, humorous, and fascinating. Jenny Penberthy has edited three collections of Lorreen Niedeker's poetry, New Goose, Lorreen Niedeker Collected Works, and Harpsichord and Saltfish, as well as a collection of her letters, Niedeker and the Correspondence with Zukowski, 1931-1970, and a collection of essays, Lorreen Niedeker, Woman and Poet. In 2016, the collection Poetry and Praxis After Objectivism from the University of Iowa Press included her essay on Lorreen Niedeker and Lisa Robertson. Currently, she's working on an edition of previously unpublished Niedeker letters and is expanding her edition of Niedeker's letters to Louis Zukowski, a former editor of the Capilano Review and the current chair of the Capilano Review Contemporary Art Society, Jenny Penberthy is our guest today. And it's a delight to welcome you and to talk about this. And I appreciate your consideration. I grew up a hundred miles from Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. So oh, really? in Chicago, on the Northwest side of Chicago. Oh, so okay. there's something about that Midwestern sensibility that really resonates with me. And um, it, I have visited her home a couple of times was astounded by how small that mm -hmm. cabin was and the right. stories of her not having uh, heating oil in the winter and living in her house in a parka in the Wisconsin winter. Some of these stories are, are just heartbreaking. And she, pers I was gonna say she persevered through it all but she only lived to age 67. So she, mm -hmm. she had, had kind of a short life, um, but, a, but a delightful subject. And I'm wondering how you first uh, were introduced to her work? Um, well, this was in the early 80s, um, and I was a, um, a starting out PhD student at the University of British Columbia um, here in Vancouver, and looking for a, for a topic for a dissertation. And I, I happened to be in London, um, and hanging out at my favorite bookshop in, in, at that time. Many of my other favorites had closed by then, but uh, um, there was Dylan's, book, Dylan's book store bookshop um, in Bloomsbury, just near the British Museum. And they had a terrific poetry section. And I picked up a, a copy of the journal called Poetry Information that had a, a special issue on Basil Bunton. And in that was an interview um, that Jonathan Williams did with, um, with Bunton. And Williams asked him who, uh, which American women poets he read. And he said that um, he basically, he, he, he read Lorraine Niedecker, had huge respect for her, thought she was good all of the time where Emily Dickinson, the kind of go-to American poet of the day, um, was good only some of the time. And so, okay, of course I had never heard of Lorraine Niedecker and back in Vancouver I went to the UBC library where they had all of their books. Um, you know, there was a pretty extraordinary um, distribution um, network at the time. And so Fulcrum Press, publishing out of London, um, and the, all of their books were distributed across American and Canadian libraries. Um, and, you know, they published, uh, they published all the major um, American poets. Um, and so I, I read, I read T&G, the Jonathan Williams Jargon um, publication and also uh, My Life by Water, the Fulcrum book. And 
I, it was just, you know, so completely apparent to me that this was the poet I, I needed to work on. Um, and then another stroke of good fortune, um, Peter Cordenan was uh, uh, teaching at, at UBC in the English department. And uh, I, I went, I looked him up and, and said, Peter, you know, how about, how about supervising a dissertation on Lorraine Niedeke? And he just about fell over um, that you know, if anybody in this university had heard of Lorraine Niedeke. So he was only too happy to, to supervise. And, um, and he, he was doing a lot of work on Zukowski at the time and uh, strongly recommended that I um, work on an edition of the, um, the letters to Zukowski. So that's how that happened. Fascinating. And was this, you see all my bookmarks coming out, different <laughs> things marked up. Was this your PhD dissertation or how no, did? No, it wasn't. I mean, initially Peter recommended that I do an edition of the poems, but then it turned out that um, Jonathan Williams was already uh, working with an editor on, on the collection that uh, eventually was published as From This Condensary. Um, that was edited by Robert Bertolt. And um, it was a, a, an extremely flawed um, edition. Um, and so having done the, the collection of, um, of the Zukowski, of the Nielke to Zukowski uh, letters, I then moved on to do the, um, um, a, a kind of new, yeah, brand new edition of the of the poems. Yeah. Tell us about the calendar poems. How did you? <laughs> when did you first uh, come across them? Yeah, so I, as part of the the process of putting together the uh, collected poems, um, I went to Austin, Texas, to the. Um, the Humanities Research Center um, to look through the Zukowski collection. Um, through, again, a sort of um, peculiar set of circumstances, Niedeke's collection is um, positioned within the Zukowski collection at, uh, at the um, center. And so um, looking you know, I was hoping to find um, poems that um, had somehow escaped notice, and and that, and so I worked my way through the the Niedeke collection within the Zukowski collection, but um, that also ran me by with the you know, various items in the Zukowski collection, particularly um, a folder of unattributed. Um, writings and you know i'd spent um quite a number of days going through the Nielika stuff and then really on my last day before coming back i found this folder of um, sort of miscellaneous items really and uh, and began working through that and of course there was Nielika's handwriting that's so unmistakable um and uh, it was, yes, it was a kind of eureka moment. Um, and, and this curious object as well, uh, this tiny little little calendar um, that she had, uh, had kind of written within. Um, so easily, easily overlooked. One of the curious things um, though, is that, uh, you know, Zukowski's uh, archive was, were, uh, the, and the papers that he sent to Texas, he himself had organized and um, and labeled. And and curious, I mean, he did that in the in the sort of early sixties. Curiously, he wasn't able to uh, label this this poem. I, I'm not sure, you know, wasn't able to, chose not to, um, you know, one of those. Um, so yeah. Um, that felt like a, a really um, important contribution to, to our understanding of what she was doing in the 1930s. 
um, very much uh, engaged in a, in a full on surrealism. Um, The fact that it was embedded in Zukovsky's materials um, says a lot about uh, her whole, uh, the whole, uh, uh, the whole reception of her poetry. I mean, a subset of Zukovsky is basically what we're saying, uh, which is completely unfair. And you know, if you, if you mention the name Louis Zukovsky at the Dwight Foster Library in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. Um, you won't get a warm response. Let's just put it, he's a persona non grata there. And yes, uh, I think it's very unfortunate. Um, uh, Zukowski was an immensely important figure in her life and she and the two of them um, valued one another's poetry immensely. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that there's been a lot of misinformation circulated about Zukowski and his uh, his friendship with Medoka. What's what's one example of that? Uh, well, the the perception um, that uh, I mean, you know, really, I'd, I'd 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 prefer not to even go near the conversation about um, about the abortion. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, people people have abortions, you know, <laughs> and in the nineteen thirties, um, uh, you know, regrettably, uh, one form of constant, uh, one form of of um, yeah, one form of protection <laughs> was offered by the prospect of an abortion, um, and I think it was. You know, it was an unremarkable um, choice uh, in in those days, um, but also you know the sense that she was uh, operating in in his shadow, and and uh, um, I, I think one of the one of the things that is not uh, it was not given sufficient attention is the amount of promotion that he did for her in the 1930s, uh, particularly. Um, he really worked to bring her poetry to the attention of editors. Um, I actually have a, a piece, a short piece in the making on this, this subject that just quotes from his letters to, to editors, um, you know, about the about the the quality of her writing and um, yeah so somehow she's portrayed as a victim um, and uh, I don't think she was uh, at all <laughs> I think she really profited um, from uh, from the relationship fantastic thank you for clarifying that it's it's good to have that point of view these calendar poems um, from what I gather, were written on pieces of paper and then pasted in the space, which actually covers up something from the calendar. So, um, is that how you found them in at the the U Texas uh, at the Austin uh, archive in, in that manner? Or how did you find them like that? Yes, yeah, so, so you know they um, she had apparently pasted these little rather flimsy sheets of paper over over the original text in the in the calendar um, and uh, yes I, I managed to um, you know read the original text through these pieces of paper it's it, they were not entirely obscured and um, you know one has to imagine that she she quite enjoyed the the residual um, visibility of those uh, those original texts um yeah and then she writes over you know in a fairly fairly kind of relaxed manner it seems to me sometimes she corrects um what she's written there's there's no sense of this this poem going out into the world for publication it's very much a um a gesture of um 
you know, fairly intimate gift, I, I, I would think. Um, nevertheless, uh, Zukowski you know, clearly showed the poem um, around, and I, I, you know, I think of it as a poem, as a as a sort of single um, extended poem. Um, and uh, there is the letter that he wrote her, where, where he says that he showed it to William Carlos Williams, who thought it should be published. Um, so yeah, you know, a kind of a both a, a gift, intimate um, gift, and uh, and a poem that uh, that he certainly took seriously. This validates what Allen Ginsberg said. You can write anything you want as long as you don't show anybody. <laughs> she was only showing one person. So maybe there was this, uh, this feeling of freedom because of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. And, she, and the feeling of freedom in that she had a very receptive um, 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 uh, very receptive audience of one, mm -hmm. yeah. Let me pull up the um, the scans of the uh, some of the calendar poems, and so people can get a sense of uh, what we're talking about, and uh, share them on the screen here. So this is what they looked like, and uh, you've got the transcription at the bottom here. There's the kind of the calendar was the favorite sunlit road calendar, <laughs> copyright 1934. Weighed all life backward to its source, which runs too far ahead which is great and little indentation. So that the field composition in 1935 seems to be, um, it seems to be used here. Can you tell us what some of your favorites are as we scroll by? Um, I like this one in particular. So this piece is within the control of everything. Yeah, you know, they, it's, I find it difficult to, to actually engage um, with these poems in in the way that I might do with some of the later stuff. Um, because they're, you know, they're, they're, they don't, um, they're, they're difficult, they're, they're not, well, they, they arrived at, but the process that she, she used to arrive at them is, is somehow a little alien. <laughs> um, she she had this practice of um, waking up and and immediately um, immediately recording her perceptions and and you know many of those are kind of wacky and and, uh, and sort of shocking and and um, and I guess that's the automatic writing that's the whole principle of automatic writing you you allow the unconscious to kind of reveal itself in, you know, um, um, and so that's pretty much what we're getting, I think, in these, in these little poems. I mean, presumably she would have, she would have um, intervened and, and, and mod you know, modified some of these, um, these early morning um, inscriptions, but, uh, you know, favorites. Well, I mean, I do, I do love the one that uh, Phil Reese had uh, had us talking about. Um, although it was only under his prompting that uh, I I ever got to think seriously about it. About it. Um, it's the one. Uh, let's see. I've got it up on the screen here, so you can just yeah. stop me. Stop me as I scroll down. Uh, okay. uh, yes, this one. <laughs> this one here, okay. So I'll, I'll go to the transcribed version so we can. Okay. Oh yeah, this is this. this. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to read it? Her understanding of him is more touching than intelligent. He holds her knees rip out her knowing how she's boned. Um, and really, I, you know, I, I only kind of registered that what she's very likely um, 
talking about here is sex with Sikorsky. Uh, um, the the uh, and, and the, the kind of awkwardness of, of that experience. Um, all these uh, these enjammed lines <laughs> and these broken words. I mean, they're um, pretty fascinating. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, kind of body parts and and uh, kind of unders and overs and standing and not standing and so on. Goes and, on and the happy ending. The one would presume. And, yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, Success, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess so. Uh, I here's the one about wraparounds and diatribes. <clears throat> I'm mm. I'm trying to scroll down to one that I think this one is is longer. I, I use the word epigrammatic, and this one wouldn't mm. uh, fall in that category because she crammed a lot in that space. But there's one um, in particular um, that is uh, a, a, about um, men's fashion, I guess. Um, is, is how I would put it. And I'm trying to find, see where that one is. Um, but, you know, there's only, what, 27? Yeah. 27 of these. So we can go through them and, and you know, scroll up and down. But it's it's the one, and I go a little further here. Um, I talk, oh, here's, well, this one comes before the one about fashion, um, <clears throat> which I think is really interesting. Um, if I can get my here it is. Oh, the and, there, and there's the poem about the muffler. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I talk at the top. Oh, see, now now my program is, um, is sort of working a little bit behind me. But there's one about I talk at the top of my white resignment, which is fascinating. And here's the, here's the one. What a white muffler in a dark coat will do for a dull man. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I feel as though she's teasing him all the way through this poem. You know? <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. And and that's a sign of love, is it not? Oh, I think they were, you know, they were having a lot of a lot of fun with each other. Yeah, and this is the one. So it's the one right before that. <clears throat> I'll go to the um, to the written one. I talk at the top of my white resignment. Mm -hmm. Goodness knows. What what do you get from that poem, Jenny? Oh, you know, I I didn't get much from it other than a sense of her her um, process. You know, um, I think with with these. Uh, Surrealist poems of hers. Um, one can't hope to get too much um, from them. I, I think one, it's very easy to overinterpret them, um, and and perhaps I've done a bit of that with my reading of the the sex with Zukatsky one. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think that primarily she's. Uh, you know, we she talked about sleeping with a pencil under her pillow and woke up and wrote, um, hoping not to intrude much of her, her conscious mind in, in, uh, in what she transcribed, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, in 2022, we would immediately suggest that there's something of race involved in this. Hmm. I doubt it. Um, there is, uh, there are a, a few comments in the 30s that are a little hard to, um, hard to interpret. Um, so for instance, in the poems that came um, pretty immediately before this one, the, the three, the three poem, um, the, the sort of triptych poems. So in the collected on page 33 and 34. Um, Unrefractory, pedal bent, prognosticate, right. yeah. Exactly, so the one on the right, um, titled T, um, 
there is a regress, certainly not in that uh, in that poem. It's sort of the first um, the first reference of its type, um, first kind of reference to to race that I've spotted anywhere. Um, and and then the one the one thing that I do know is that um, at at about this time she had been to Chicago, had hoped to see Harriet Monroe, but for some reason had missed seeing Monroe and had also missed the production of uh, Gertrude Stein's um, Three Saints. And that the striking thing about that production was that it was an all black cast. Um, so, you know, there's, there's very, very little um, to find in, in the 30s in the, in the way of reference to race. Um, and, you know, we have the, right away, we have the white muffler, you know, so is it like white resignment and white muffler? Um, uh, yeah, I think one has to be careful to ascribe these, you know, awarenesses. Um, in, in that period. Um, she was living in, in very white Wisconsin um, at that time. And, um, you know, if anything, um, what one can look for in this period is her, her um, reference to Native American um, presence and culture. And she certainly has uh, way more awareness of that than she does of Black America. The material on her um, uh, Native American um, engagement, where would we find that? Well, so, um, you know, there's the poem that she wrote in the, in the late, later 30s about Black Hawk. Okay? Um, and that is based on her reading of Black Hawk's autobiography. Um, so we know she was, you know, she'd read that. She lived on Black Hawk Island after all, and uh, and would have had a, a natural curiosity about the naming of the island, um, as she would have had about Fort Atkinson and who he might have been, um, and his relation to the, the native peoples of, of that uh, region. And she was working in the... Um, in the late 30s, she was working in Madison on the WPA uh, project. Um, and they, they were working on the Wisconsin guide, uh, the travel guide, but also on the, on the biographies of Wisconsin um, uh, figures. And you know, she quite, quite possibly um, encountered the Black Hawk autobiography at that time. Uh, but there, you know, there's so much work that's that needs to be done on Medeca. Um, and um, you know, there's a lot waiting to be done on on what she actually was researching in those days working working in Madison. Um, she went from the WPA project when and when that was shut down. Um, and and worked on a, a radio station. Um, doing her own program on um, the uh, civilian um, war effort um, in you know locally in, in Madison, uh, and uh, Carl Galton recently sent me uh, all of the, the scripts. You know she wrote the scripts for these for these shows, um, and you know this. <laughs> Somebody, somebody needs to do a major project on, on this. Uh, and there are many such projects waiting for Nida for scholars. Mm -hmm. Black Hawk was a fierce leader. A Sauk, was it the Sauk tribe? Mm -hmm. I believe it is. Yeah. And um, was, uh, uh, had uh, named after him a, a battalion, I believe it was in World War I. Uh, and from that, 
the professional hockey team in Chicago, one of the six original six NHL teams, uh, named the Chicago Blackhawks. So mm -hmm. they and their their logo um, ostensibly um, continues to have a representation of uh, uh, what Blackhawk may have looked like. Um, all these teams named after uh, indigenous people uh, are changing their names, the Indians in Cleveland, the baseball team, because of maybe because of the goofy logo they had, the Redskins, obvious, for obvious reasons, that's an offensive term. And yet the, the Blackhawks seem to, um, may, maybe they're next, I don't know, or maybe because they're seen as being reverent and using that as a leader, uh, as, a, as an example of fierceness, a Blackhawk who fought against Abraham Lincoln in the wars of his day. Well, many, many such leaders did. I, I would hope that the Chicago Black Hawks um, pay royalties to the uh, sort of people. Yeah. Very, uh, I think there them. is. I think there is a positive relationship, from what I can tell, but I haven't researched that. Mm -hmm. The other thing about Niederker's connection to um, indigenous culture is that um, Black Hawk Island is not an island it's a peninsula mm -hmm. that sticks into lake koshkanong which is mm -hmm. obviously an, a, an indigenous name and lake koshkanong is uh ringed with different indian mounds so on yes, some level yes. it was a very very powerful site and mm -hmm. somehow uh lorraine nieker was able to uh, tap into that on some level and um i think uh, a a possible essay might take its cue from D.H. Lawrence's uh, depiction of Walt Whitman as the first white Aboriginal. And uh, I think uh, Lorene may be the second. And I think maybe she found a way to, I mean, she obviously found a way to um, uh, derive inspiration from the place in which she lived. You know, I grew up in Chicago, a very similar kind of swampy, marshy, flat, really kind of an uninspiring uh, landscape compared to something like Seattle or Vancouver, where we look out our windows and we see mountains and glaciers and fjords and what have you. And a lot um, of rain. <laughs> and, and a lot of rain, yeah. Well, less humidity than Fort Atkins in Wisconsin, and for that we're grateful. But if someone were interested in doing research on Niedeker, where are her archives kept? Well, it isn't a great deal um, of material out there. They, um, and we we're all aware of the fact that her papers were destroyed after her death. Um, um, and, uh, at, at her request. At her request, yes. And I, I recently, um, so I, you know, I, as you said, I'm, I'm working on a, um, a collection of letters previously unpublished. And so I've been in touch with a lot of, a lot of archives and, um, the, this collection of letters is only um, possible because so many libraries have now digitized their inventories. And so I've been able to locate um, materials that I, I didn't ever hope to, uh, to uh, identify. Um, anyway, so I recently wrote a letter written by Elmer's daughter-in-law. Um, and written a few days, um, or maybe, I guess there are two letters. One is written the day after Nilaka's death, and, the, and another one is a week or two later. And she, in the, in the later letter, writes about how they have destroyed her papers. Um, and, and she says, you know, of course, uh, we found the letter from the ring that said the stuff must be destroyed. But then she also refers to the journals um, that, that needed to be, the fate of which needed to be decided, and that she would consult with Lorraine's lawyer um, to see whether he thought they, they had any value. Anyway, we don't know. I, um, there are there are interviews that Gail Rob did with Fred Hope, um, the the Nina Millen lawyer, and certainly no mention is ever made of these journals. 
but the journals were evidently destroyed. And, um, you know, these are journals that she kept throughout her life. Um, and the, the loss of those is, uh, is just practically unbearable. Um, so, yeah, the, the Texas has um, all of the drafts of poems that she um, exchanged with Zukowski. Um, it has all of her letters to him and her letters to Edward Dahlberg. Um, otherwise, uh, the, uh, Ford Atkinson has the papers that Gail Robb um, donated to the, to the museum. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, there are a few scraps of things here and there. Um, uh, Buffalo, Zuni, um, um, Buffalo has, uh, has some papers, but um, yeah, they have to be uh, pieced together and, the, you know, so for somebody to do the research into the WPA work, which would involve going to Madison and, and going to the Wisconsin Historical Society that has all of those records. Um, so there, you know, there's a fair amount of sleuthing that has to go on because they you can't walk in and say, you know, where are the Lorene Mudeke materials? They're embedded in this uh, this much larger archive. Um, so you know, there's the the work that's to be done. Like I, I always think that somebody needs to write about um, the influence of Charles Olson on on Mudeke. Um, you know, when, when we talk about the, the place of, of, of uh, Native American culture and history um, in, in her writing, um, a lot of that shows itself in the Lake Superior project, um, where she wrote, you know, what, what was ultimately a, a relatively short poem, but she, um, she did a huge amount of, of research and note taking, um, in, you know, in the, in the process of of writing that poem. And in those notes, one sees a lot of reference to Native Americans. Um, and indeed, in the poem itself, in her letters to uh, Sid Coleman, particularly, um, she, she wrote quite a bit about um, her reactions to Olson and his, his relation to place and, and so on. Um, so I think that the uh, the Lake Superior poem is uh, is very much written with an awareness of of Olson, but equally an awareness of Melville. She was um, immersed in the reading of Melville at the time that she wrote that poem. You know, so I, I, one of the things I feel is that um, her poems need to be read in in the context of her reading. Um, and we do know something about her reading, of course, uh, from the letters she wrote to other people, but also um, from her library. And her, her library is, um, is uh, located now in the, in the Dwight Foster Public Library in Fort Atkinson. And, uh, you know, when I first saw that, that library of hers, um this was in the go there um in the sort of mid 90s um <laughs> the books were still being the, alone they were still being loaned out weren't they <laughs> well actually they weren't at this point uh, they were in they were in a in a special cabinet but they were filled with her notes uh, you know pages of of her notes and had been inserted into, into the books. And so anybody going to have a look at them could so easily um, make off with, uh, with a bundle of notes, you know. Um, it, it, uh, it did take a while before those were catalogued and saved, um, you know, separately from, from the books. But the books are full of annotations, you know. Um, and so, um, there's also a great need for a study of that uh, of that collection. Um, there are extraordinary things written in the margins of uh, of these books. The immortal cupboard. 
<laughs> the Immortal Cupboard was, in fact, a tiny thing that just had about 12 books in it mm -hmm. um, and not, not the entire collection of books. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Corman letter where she re references Olson, um, are those letters published? Yeah, yeah. But again, you know, um, published in, in Lisa Ferrando's wonderful edition um, from the early 80s, published by Duke University Press, practically inaccessible book. Um, and, you know, this same thing um, has occurred with, with my edition of uh, Renée Lekertuzikovsky letters, published by Cambridge University Press. Um, they, in fact, printed a paperback edition um, several years after the hardcover. And Paul Zikowski blocked its, uh, its circulation. So they, they pulped the entire run of uh, the paperback. Um, but anyway, I recently approached Cambridge University Press um, and asked them to um, return the rights to, to the book to me because it has um, not been, um, you know, it's been out of circulation. Basically, it's out of print and it's been out of print for well over a decade. So they, they agreed to that. And um, I'm in the process now of, um, of putting together an expanded version of that collection. And I'm hoping to, um, to publish that as, uh, as an ebook, you know, an open source ebook. Um, because I, I feel that one of the one of the obstacles to um, considered um, research into Nidoka is that the primary sources are not available. And, um, you know, so if these letters can be, if the, the letters to Zukowski, which are a very fundamental um, source and very fundamental to an understanding of, of her um, career, if those are now freely available, that will, that will help. And then the other thing is I've also approached um, the National Poetry Foundation in Maine to um, uh, recover the rights to um, Lauren Medek, a woman and poet, because that too is out of print. Uh, I think there are two copies that, are, that remain, um, uh, remain on sale. And um, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to, um, I think it's going to be a, a, a PDF of that book that I'll make available again as an open source um, text. How does a poet of this potency get overlooked as much as she did? How does that happen? You know, I think that she's a very difficult poet to um, engage with. And, you know, partly we're seeing this with the calendar poem. You know, how does one enter that poem? It just, it's, it's almost impossible. You know, we kind of venture into it thinking, Oh, well, maybe the white muffler belongs to Zukowski. You know, it's really, it's not, it's not really a helpful um, observation. <laughs> no, I, 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 I love uh, repeating what Spicer said, that the poet is a time mechanic, not an embalmer. And I think <laughs> when you try and, when you try and uh, butcher these poems, deconstruct them, uh, you're not doing anyone any favors. So I, I yeah. didn't shy away from that. But, but it's interesting to speculate, especially, you know, I mean, that poem that you referred to, uh, How She's Boned, uh, you know, it's a vulgar expression. <laughs> I mean, you don't publish that. You don't publish it now. You don't publish it in 1935, you can imagine. So uh, that kind of expression and, you know. I, I wonder how, if it was current in 1935. I mean, I, I, I must do a search to see. Um, it may not have been. Um, you know, I mean, Morgan Gibson in the 1960s um, gets, uh, well, he wrote to me um, in, the, in the 80s um, to say that he couldn't believe that, that Nidoka didn't, didn't realize the meaning of come. Um, and, uh, and, and he's, you know, uh, she, because she, I think she, 
she kind of draws attention to his use of come and 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 so she she feels he's making you know that he's using the word too much or something or other but she clearly doesn't realize you know the meaning that uh, morgan is is giving to the word and uh, yeah you know these these usages are perhaps generational and uh, uh, i'm just not not sure about burned <laughs> in the 1930s uh, but anyway you know. um there there is that poem page 118 or 218 of the collected works uh which alludes to that uh, truth gives heat he blushed when i said before he came i never wore beads <laughs> and a student informs me a worship participant informs me that there's an allusion to that in the kama sutra which i didn't know so um, fascinating to think of the uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, x-rated nature the r-rated nature of some of the poems um yeah, yeah, it, and you know even that i'm not persuaded is uh you know is a is a pain referencing an orgasm <laughs> in fort atkinson lorene niedeker has become sort of a cottage industry there are beautiful murals another new one just went up according mm -hmm. to solitary plover mm -hmm. and um, you've dedicated a great uh, deal of your life's work to um, resurrecting the reputation and uh, uh, and, and literary uh, in reception of Lorraine Niedeker what has engaging with her work uh, meant for you in your life oh, well um it's uh, it's interesting because I haven't ever been able to let go of her, um, and I think it's partly that um, the the poetry is um, uh, it has a, a kind of gnomic uh, quality. Um, one doesn't easily fathom it. Um, and, and I think this is partly why um, she hasn't attracted a, a lot of attention. Um, there is something um, almost hermetic about it. Um, and, and, and one of the things that does fascinate me is, um, is the relation between the poems and other texts. Um, and, you know, one gets that somewhat in the, in the calendar poem. Um, and I'm, I'm continuing to stumble on, um, and again, this is partly due to the um, digitization of so many, many documents. But, uh, you know, I talked to Al Filreis a, a, a few years ago about Lyrica's poem about Linnaeus. Um, and um, it turns out that that poem is every word in that poem is drawn from um, Linnaeus's journals. Um, and, you know, that relationship to another text, um, again, it's, uh, it, it makes it very difficult to intervene as a, as a critic um, and to, um, you know, to, to comment on, on the poem itself. I mean, the poem has has a kind of a, you know derivative quality um, that that makes it go yeah it, 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 it kind of blocks um, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, critical intervention. I, I think it makes um, uh, the the scholarly work infinitely more interesting um, but it's uh, yeah. It's not yeah. readily accept, uh, accessible work. Right. When you so, say, you know, on the surface, one would think, oh, well, you know, yes, this is, uh, you know, I get this. But in fact, one seldom gets <laughs> what's really going on. Right. You use the word derivative. I'm reminded of Robert Duncan, who was referred to himself as a derivative, derivative poet. Mm -hmm. um, fascinating. 
and it's it's endlessly fascinating. Did you use the word gnomic, G N O M I C, to describe her work? Is it? Is, did I get that right? Okay, I just want to make sure because <laughs> I think that's a good word to describe it, and uh, it just shows, um, you know, uh, maybe it's maybe it was uh, fate that uh, these things would only come out. Um, after she died she maybe would not have wanted to publish those calendar poems for mm -hmm. instance and now we have the beauty of them uh, which I think um, if my workshop participants are any example um, there's a lot of juice one can derive from reading those and um, incorporating these kinds of practices in one's own life and I want to go to Austin now and see what she was responding to uh, underneath uh, the calendar, whatever the calendar thing said, I'd love to see. Actually, you know, um, I had an interesting exchange with a doctoral student a number of years ago who um, had found on eBay um, a, a copy of that very calendar and, uh, and who uh, sent me all of the, um, the texts under there. If you want that, I'll send them to you. <laughs> Oh, that'd be fantastic. Oh, that would be fan. Or we line that up because because you have the dates and so you can square that up. Yeah. You know, I'm really grateful for your time today. And I know that you've been sick lately and uh, that you kind of pushed through to make this happen. So um, that and also for all the incredible work that you've done this, uh, having this book, you know, it's been a lot of my own life, you know, uh, her having grown up or me having grown up 100 miles from where she was you know, makes me feel proud of being from that part of the world and what can be done from there and uh, how uh, how it's her, her work has blossomed in what, the last 52 years, mostly a testament to you, is just a beautiful message for us all. Do the work for the love of doing it and let the rest sort itself out. And uh, that's a potent message, especially when the work is as good as Lorraine's work. So thank you. Thanks, Paul.